I thought I'd make a quick video about today's shocking event in the Euro 2020 Football Championships when Christian Eriksen collapsed during a match between his team Denmark and Finland. He required CPR, so I figured there might be quite a few concerned fans wondering what on earth happened. Thankfully, the latest news is that he's awake and stable in hospital, and I wish him a full and speedy recovery. My name is Rohan, I'm a cardiologist here in the UK, and if you're new here, I often talk about cardiac arrest and topics surrounding that, but also sport, so I thought I could try to explain a few things. Please do excuse the fact I'm shooting in a dark room at night. Another thing I often do on this channel is film during a night shift at work, and while I'm not at work this weekend, I'm still having to film in the middle of the night. Apologies for that, because you see, today was my wife's birthday, and it was our wedding anniversary, so as I didn't want to provoke divorce proceedings on the celebration of the day we got married, I didn't think it would go down very well if I told her that content comes first and accordingly I've had to wait until everyone is asleep. One thing I want to say up front is that I sometimes get uncomfortable when doctors pontificate about public figures' health, like when people were trying to diagnose Trump with this and that. So even though I'm talking about Ericsson, this is more to use what's happened as an opportunity to educate about topics surrounding this, rather than to speculate about exactly what happened in this case. So I've made a little list of topics to cover. Um, What happened and is this common? What could have caused it and why are athletes heart special? Um, Why wasn't this picked up during screening? And I should say that screening athletes is an enormous topic and I'm only going to kind of touch on this. And is this anything to do with COVID or the vaccine? And um, what can you do if something like this happens to someone you know? So the information that we've got right now is encouraging. He's obviously not out of the woods yet, and he'll stay in hospital for a while longer, undergoing many tests. During my PhD, actually, I collaborated with the Riggs Hospitalet in Copenhagen, where he is, so, and I know that it's got an outstanding cardiac centre with fantastic people there, so he's in safe hands. It appears that he suffered a cardiac arrest, meaning that his heart effectively stopped going into a highly abnormal rhythm where the heart doesn't sort of beat normally like this, but quivers with a disorganised electrical activity. This rapidly This is rapidly fatal if not corrected with defibrillation, which is the body's control out delete, a cardiac reset. So we deliver an electric shock to the heart, which puts it back into a normal rhythm. If this is delivered very quickly within a few minutes, in most healthy people, it will be effective, very effective. But until this is done, chest compressions attempt to replicate the pumping of the heart by sending some blood to the brain. Now, I understand he was shocked with the defib, suggesting that this is what happened. So is this common amongst elite athletes? Well, absolutely not, because athletes are fitter than average, because major heart problems will either be screened out or simply prevent somebody getting to a high level. The rate of sudden arrhythmias, i.e. abnormal rhythms, is much lower than in the general population, but athletes push their heart to a much more extreme level than us mere mortals, especially in a strenuous sport like football, so they still occur when an undiagnosed condition is unmasked by extreme exertion. So why did it happen? Again, talking more generically rather than specifically about Ericsson, it could be for any number of reasons. The most common cause of sudden death in athletes and if he had not had medical intervention, this would have been death, is inherited cardiac disorders, most commonly something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a pathological thickening of the heart muscle. Often this can be picked up by routine tests, but sometimes it isn't. And remember, not all sporting leagues will do the same thing. Now, at the level of international footballer in a top club, Ericsson plays for Inter Milan, Ericsson will have undergone the most rigorous screening. But in lower leagues or in other countries, this isn't always the case, and players with major abnormalities might have been missed. There is a Wikipedia page with dozens of names of young people who've died of cardiac arrest whilst playing football, more than I actually realised. Athletes' hearts are unusual. Repeated, strenuous physical activity causes changes to the heart, such as it getting bigger and beating slower, but even more subtle things like microscopic Uh, scarring appearing in the muscle itself. Professional sports people like footballers or cyclists are, you know, operating more than two or three standard deviations away from the mean. These are people pushing their bodies to the absolute limits. The vast, vast majority of the time, these changes are not harmful. But sometimes it's impossible to tell between 
the changes being caused by exercise or some abnormal process underlying it. And one of the leading experts in this field worldwide is here in London, and he gives a talk where he shows us ECGs, heart tracings of professional athletes, and then people with severe heart disease and asks us to guess which is which, and most of the time we in the audience can't actually tell. So this is really the million dollar question when it comes to screening athletes. What are we actually looking for? Let's take two extremes of kind of screening, and that's what, what we mean by screening is looking for abnormalities before any symptoms are present. First, let's imagine a situation where we take young players, so these are kind of people at the academy level, and screen them, and absolutely anything abnormal is highly highlighted. We tell every single one of these players that they have to detrain and they cannot pursue a career in international sport. Now, we will definitely prevent some sudden cardiac deaths. But remember, these are very, very rare events. What we will also do is prevent thousands of entirely healthy young people uh, having a chance to pursue their dream. Now, you know, maybe one would go on to become a, a Messi or Ronaldo. And this is called a, f a false positive, when we have an abnormal re a result kind of on paper, but actually it doesn't correlate with a, a genuine abnormality. The other extreme is that we don't screen anybody at all. And then, of course, these awful events will occur from time to time, but we won't erroneously prevent a healthy person from playing. And getting that balance right, especially after something as emotive as today, is really, really tough. Now, I'm very fortunate. Some of my friends are real experts in this field. I'm purely an amateur here, so I'll definitely circle back to this in another video uh, and involve them uh, because there's a lot to say here. But this begs the question, why wasn't this picked up? First of all, you know, we don't know what this is, but of course it's reminiscent of Fabrice Moamba uh, and his collapse some years ago right here in London. I've talked about him quite a few times before on this channel. Both Moamba and Ericsson are top flight players, so there's no question that they didn't undergo intense medical screening. So how come think something was missed? They both suffered cardiac arrest uh, on the pitch. And the simple answer is that no test is 100% perfect. There will always be false negatives. So we've heard about false positives. This is false negatives. So you get a normal result of the test, but actually there is an abnormality there. Maybe the abnormality was too subtle when they were screened and over time it became more significant. Maybe in Ericsson's case, it's the type of disorder that doesn't show up on a conventional test, or maybe it's one of the many diseases that we don't even know exists or we don't understand because the gene encoding for it hasn't actually been deciphered. Something I've seen a lot of speculation about online, so I wanted to tackle it, is was this something to do with COVID or the COVID vaccine? Now, obviously, I can't say for sure, and you shouldn't believe anyone who speaks about this with confidence because it is all speculation, but it's worth exploring. Now, we have no evidence that Ericsson had COVID. Last year, I made a video about athletes, hearts, and COVID, and you'll recall there was a lot of fear about what um, COVID's after effects could be on athletes' hearts. More recently, um, there's actually other, friend, other friends of mine, you're maybe starting to see that cardiology is actually a quite small world, published a brilliant study quite recently doing the most detailed assessment on people who'd recovered from COVID and found that their hearts were on the whole, probably not that different from people who have recovered from other viral illnesses, which is not to say that there's no damage, but that it's probably in line with other infections. And people do get viruses, people do have chronic inflammation after the virus, and people do suffer cardiac arrest, especially if you're pushing your heart to the limit, like an extreme like elite athlete. And as a complication, this is all as a complication of inflammation within the heart. So COVID could be implicated simply because there is a lot around, i.e. there's nothing necessarily that special about COVID and its effect on the heart, but because we're in a pandemic and COVID is very prevalent, all complications are going to be seen relatively commonly. So in a way, this might actually be a good diagnosis for Ericsson because it's likely to be temporary. It's, re it's a reversible problem. If he's found to have an inherited, i.e. a genetic condition, then... Sadly, I think his professional career might be over. Now, a link to the vaccine is a lot more complex. There have been some unsubstantiated claims online about when Ericsson had the vaccine. I don't know if those are true or not, but we, we do know he, he will have had the vaccine. Um, now, you might have seen links drawn between the vaccine and this same heart inflammation that I just mentioned, um, 
which can happen after a virus, which is called myocarditis. Now, rough numbers, but out of about 15 million vaccinated people under the age of 30 in the US, there have been 226 cases of myocarditis, compared to about 100 to 150 that you'd expect in an unvaccinated population of the same size. And 81% of those people that had proven myocarditis had a complete and full recovery. Now, there are a few things to bear in mind when interpreting this statistic. Firstly, that myocarditis can occur spontaneously to anyone, vaccinated or not. And we've never before monitored and followed up so many people so intensely. So people are being told to be wary of any unusual symptoms and report them after taking a vaccine. So we might simply be picking up spontaneous cases that would have been ignored as something trivial ordinarily. Secondly, these are tiny percentages. So the difference might not be significant. And most importantly, there is no evidence of causation at present, but it is absolutely something worth keeping an eye on. So could Ericsson's vaccine have been implicated? Well, even if we assume that the vaccine does increase rates of myocarditis, which I don't think is an unreasonable um, uh, conclusion based on, on the figures that I've just talked about, it's extremely unlikely that that was the case uh, that was implicated in today, but simply because uh, based on numbers. So that's not me commenting on the vaccine's tendency to cause myocarditis or not. It's just a reflection of the statistics. In fact, if you just go on the numbers alone, it's less likely than most of the other potential causes on this list. Next, I wasn't really sure whether to say this bit, but I don't think we should beat around the bush when it comes to something so important, because this is perhaps the most valuable thing that I'm going to say. And it's that acting fast saves lives. Referee Anthony Taylor was admirably quick in realising something was seriously wrong and calling the medics on straight away, but a long time passed before they actually started CPR. They seemed to be trying to wake Ericsson up by shaking him. I wasn't even sure that I could see them checking for a pulse for a long time. I'm not going to re replay any of the footage here, but from what I can tell, it's something like two to three minutes before any chest compressions were started. And I couldn't really tell when, when defibrillation occurred. Now, we've had some really high-profile cardiac arrests on the pitch in football. Fabrice Moamba, of course, that I mentioned earlier, is probably the most memorable, certainly, in my lifetime. While it seems there's been a fantastic outcome today, which is really important to emphasize from the emergency, uh, and the medics do deserve all of the praise they're receiving for saving a life, which they did. Um, I, I, you know, I want to be clear, they, they saved his life. And, you know, God, I can't imagine how nerve wracking it must be to deal with a medical emergency in front of millions of viewers. I'm a little uncomfortable with how long it took to start CPR after someone collapsed in cardiac arrest. Now, Ericsson is super, super fit. And so a few minutes without a cardiac output might not have any significant effect for him. But if this was somebody in the street, those few minutes could be the difference between life and death or between having a complete recovery and having long-term neurological damage. So here's what you need to know. If somebody collapses, first check it's safe to approach, you know, they've been electrocuted, they're not surrounded by live wires or something, then shout to them to respond. You can shake them on the shoulder. If they haven't responded after a few seconds, look for signs of life. So check for 10 seconds to see if they're breathing. 10 seconds, not three minutes. If they're not breathing, or if you think they're breathing in a kind of weird, abnormal way, call an ambulance and start chest compressions. If you're not medically trained, you don't need to worry about checking for a pulse. Resus guidelines are very clear in all countries. You should not be worried about causing harm from CPR if the person is not in cardiac arrest. If they've just fainted, they'll soon come around and go, ah, just get off me like this. No harm done. Chest compressions are um, need to be hard and fairly fast. They're in the lower half of the sternum with two hands, five to six centimeters depression each time at a rate of about 100 to 120 a minute. So look up some songs with this tempo, memorize your favorite one. The classic one that we always teach is Bee Gees Staying Alive, of course. And it's now recommended to give continuous chest compressions rather than attempting mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breaths unless you're willing to do so and you've had training. So uh, con continuous chest compressions is absolutely fine. 
And the other priority is a defibrillator. The sooner this is put on, the better. Public defibs are becoming more and more ubiquitous and they're fully automated. So you just connect them up and they'll tell you what to do. So that's really it. There's only three key things to remember. Ambulance, chest compressions and defib. Good CPR and early defibrillation are what saves lives, much more than any of the fancy toys that I've got in the hospital. By the time patients get to me, bystanders like you have already done the hard part and saved their lives. When patients do get to me, if I hear the patient received no CPR for six minutes, unfortunately the outlook is really grim, but if I hear there was good quality immediate bystander CPR, then I feel positive. So you can make a difference to results, and this is evidenced by places like Seattle where everybody learns basic life support and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest rates, uh, success rates are markedly better. And, you know, we joke that it's the best city in the world to have a cardiac arrest, but probably the worst to fall asleep in the park. That's a joke. So please don't be afraid to try chest compressions. And indeed, please learn uh, some basic uh, CPR, because how many things can you learn in a few hours that might save somebody's life? We're all hoping that Christian makes a full and rapid recovery and we're thinking of him and his family. Maybe it's a small consolation, but life could be much worse. He could still be playing for Spurs. I want to end on a positive. One of the things I, I really loved was the fact that one of the encouraging bits of news that was released to show he was okay was the Inter boss saying that Ericsson had messaged the Inter Milan WhatsApp group. And I just enjoy the idea of a team of international superstars having a little WhatsApp group. I hope Ericsson's contribution was a meme which is the only fitting way to demonstrate proof of life. It was also very heartwarming to see all the players rallying around a fallen member of their ranks and to see dedications from Inter teammate Romelu Lukaku and Ashraf Hakimi. But I wanted to end with this clip of Danish fans chanting Christian and the Finnish fans replying Ericsson.